Shadowfoot. The large Nasha glanced over his shoulder and the burlap bag he was carrying to meet the gaze of the small human following him. What is it? he grunted. The small human shrugged as she let her own bag drop with a dull thud onto the dirt. What's the point of stealing all the good stuff if we just have to fence it? I mean, most of it's going to go to the higher- Because we're a family, and you'd best remember that. He turned to look down at her, his sky-blue eyes steely as he spoke. She rolled her eyes and sighed as she found a crate to lean against, out of sight of the main road, as she settled in for another one of Shadowfoot's lectures. Everyone in the guild needs the coin. Not everyone has as much potential as you do in fieldwork, but everyone needs to eat. She scoffed at his remark as he leaned against the stone building, still holding on tightly to the bag of loot. Oh, yeah, I forgot Greed Eye needs to eat stuffed axe beak each meal while we're gnawing on stale bread, she mocked. How will he ever live without it? The guild isn't perfect, he admitted, but at least you do get bread. Others on the streets aren't so lucky. We both know the good marks always have more than they need, but they like to keep a hold of it like a bag of tricks does with prey. She gave an unladylike snort, obviously uncaring of her mentor's reasoning. I'm just saying, if everything we're making from these heists just goes to another rich snob instead of those in need, I might just be better off on my own. His ears pricked up to a distant cry of alarm from the direction they'd just come from, signaling that their thievery had not gone unnoticed. Look, he sighed, when I first took you in, I saw potential in you and what you could bring to the guild. He continued as he inclined his head in the direction they'd been going, indicating it was time to get moving again. One day, I'm hoping you will take on my title and be a fine purloiner without losing sight of what it means to be a part of the guild. She gave a non-committal grunt as she stood and stretched, before deftly swinging the sack back over her shoulder. Let's hope I get to learn some of your best tricks before one of those fat cats takes it out of your hide. He gave her a rare smirk at the jab before he continued towards the fence's previously arranged handoff point. <laughs> they can try, Syra, he chuckled. They can certainly try. A slit coin purse, a dagger, a ring. Shadowfoot almost absent-mindedly lifted a valuable-looking trinket off a cart as he walked through the crowded street, remembering that day with his apprentice. Was that the day she decided to run from the guild? Or was it something she decided on later? A bright red fruit appeared in his hand, and he began to snack on the morsel. Such easy marks were usually beneath his attention, but it helped to relax him in much the same way as a warrior with a whetstone would sharpen a sword. A repeated action had kept him and his craft sharp and ready for the next job. Besides, he had been reminiscing about his runaway apprentice for quite some time lately, and it had proven to be a dangerous distraction in one of his more recent heists. A gold bracelet made its way into his pouch as he rubbed his muzzle, the steel-gray fur standing on end as his annoyance spiked when he recalled how he'd almost had her when she made her escape. She'd slipped away during a pitched fight with some guards, pretending to be far more injured than she was when she'd gotten a dagger across the face, pocketing the item they'd been sent to steal for herself. He'd have been proud of her resourcefulness if it wasn't for the fact she had left the guild and abandoned the family she'd grown up with, leaving him to deal with the embarrassment and loss of authority within the guild. He slipped into an alley as a few guards passed by, narrowly missing the purloiner in their patrol. Since her escape, He'd had a hard time getting the other members of the Thieves' Guild to follow his lead. Some of them were taking on reckless jobs they weren't ready for and losing their heads as a result. Others were hoarding their goods, looking to join the rich snobs they'd taken their loot from. Maybe they'd always been like that. But at least when his name meant something, he'd been able to protect the Guild from getting on the wrong person's bad side, both in and out of the Guild. Now. He wasn't so sure he could keep everyone in the guild safe from their own greed.
he slipped some of his smaller goods to a fence as he passed by, palming the coins he got in return. He'd been tasked by the guild leadership to find his apprentice, and, after a good deal of time, he'd finally been forced to admit she'd either gotten much better at covering her tracks in a short amount of time, or she'd left the city and the surrounding area. He snarled a bit at the thought, startling the goblin he was interrogating for information about the building he had been observing the past few days. There wasn't any way he could fix his reputation so long as she wasn't caught and made an example out of. A few coins silently found their way into the pockets of a child begging for alms. The guild had two ironclad rules. The first was to never steal from the poor. Many of the guild members came from humble beginnings and had turned to thievery out of desperation when those with the means to help turned their backs on the sufferers. Those who broke this rule were dealt with harshly by their fellows. A small sack of medicine mysteriously appeared at the doorstep of an ailing mother's home. The second rule was to never kill. Killing someone could put the entire guild in danger and was a decision that led to even darker paths, better left unexplored. This did not mean that the guild was averse to violence as a tool to gain their coin. On the contrary, muggings and ransoms yielded some of the guild's more lucrative jobs. Both rules were based on the idea of family. One should not steal from family and friends when that was all you had left in the world. Placing the family in unnecessary danger with your actions was also unforgivable. While Syra hadn't technically broken either of those rules, she'd broken the third unspoken rule within the guild. Once you were part of the guild, you did not leave. As night descended, he made his final preparations for his next job. A merchant known for charging exorbitant prices for his goods and paying suppliers bound by complicated contracts barely enough to keep themselves fed, let alone clothed, Shadowfoot wasn't a knight in shining armor. He was a thief. However, he wasn't about to let someone get away with robbing others with a few words on a piece of parchment and getting the law to protect them from the consequences. He kept close to the walls, ducking behind the sculpted foliage that ringed the area whenever torchlight drew too close. There was no need for him to carry a source of light as his eyes adjusted to the moonless night, allowing him to remain hidden. Eventually, he reached the part of the wall he decided to scale and brought out the length of rope he'd brought along. After making sure the guards were well past his chosen spot, he secured the rope on one of the garish ornaments the owner had foolishly decided to incorporate into the wall's design. It was a simple matter to scale the wall and be over the other side before the guards came. Once on the other side, Shadowfoot picked out a window that had been left ajar on the second floor and began the slow ascent up the stone wall, using the claws he'd been born with to find the tiniest of handholds. While it wasn't easy, he finally reached the window, hoisting himself into the room. The snoring from the bed caused him to pause as he silently slunk through the room, careful not to wake the pudgy human. If Shadowfoot hadn't known beforehand, he might have mistaken the human in the luxurious bed for an orc with how portly he was. No telling how long he's been squeezing the common folk dry, Shadowfoot mused. Let's see how he likes it when he's the one getting squeezed. Shadowfoot took a soft step onto the bed to loom over the overweight merchant, the feline's large frame difficult to make out in the darkness. The merchant snorted as his muddled mind tried to make sense of the shadow that towered over him before his eyes went wide in alarm. There was no opportunity for the man to shout an alarm before Shadowfoot's curved dagger was at his neck. Make a sound, and you will be losing your head, he bluffed. I just want a nice chat with you about some protection I can offer you. Shadowfoot reached into his pouch with his free hand to wave a letter in the frightened man's face. You see, there is a little matter of what you sold to your friend in the royal court, he purred. You claim you sold him a genuine griffin feather cloak for his new wardrobe that he's been parading around 
for the last week. This letter with your personal seal shows you actually sold those feathers to someone else at a premium and replaced them with dyed axe beak feathers. Thanks to his ability to see in the dark, Shadowfoot saw the merchant visibly pale as he broke out into a cold sweat. Now, it would be quite a shame if this letter were to find its way to your friend's desk at supper time. Quite a shame indeed. Although, I guess it could conveniently disappear if a crate filled with dragon scales were to drop off a cart tomorrow while on the way to the dwarven holds. The merchant's eyes widened in outrage at the thought before a gentle press of the knife turned silent outrage into a whimper of assent. Good, Shadowfoot smiled. I knew you'd make the smart decision. He withdrew the dagger and swiftly leapt out the window as a squeal of fury and outrage followed his escape. But it was too late. Shadowfoot was over the wall and had disappeared into the dark streets before the guards could even make it to the merchant's room. As Shadowfoot relaxed in a bed at a trustworthy innkeep's establishment for the night, his stay paid in full, of course, a rap on the door caused him to tense. He waited a few moments before he silently padded towards the door, hand on the blade at his side. The innkeep was sympathetic to the thieves' guild, but that didn't mean he could become careless. Another few moments, and he slowly opened the door to scan the hall. A lone, unmarked letter lay at the foot of his door. He quickly plucked it off the wooden boards and retreated into his room to read its contents by the flickering candlelight. Written in thieves' cant, it informed Shadowfoot that Syra had been spotted near an abandoned mine known as the Crystal Cove, and Greedeye expected Shadowfoot to make all due haste in finding and capturing her. He held the letter to the flame, his brow furrowing ever so slightly as he allowed the hungry flames to gradually consume the parchment. The answer to his problems and the guilds were now in his grasp, but he still had some lingering doubts as he released the burning letter, the last scraps blackening as it flared for one last time on the wooden floor. Although killing was forbidden, there had been some rumors going around of problematic persons within the guild disappearing for no known reason. Shadowfoot wasn't about to carry out a kill order, even if it wasn't a direct one. Yet, an example had to be made of her to protect the authority of the leaders and the decisions they made to protect the guild as a whole. Shadowfoot ground the letter's ashes into the floor and snuffed the flickering candle out. He returned to the bed, his eyes slowly closing for the night, as something his own mentor had taught him echoed in his drifting mind. The guild was a family, and sometimes family had to be disciplined to make clear what was and was not acceptable. True, they were thieves. But just as true was the fact they were all family. A family of thieves. 